Welcome back to Intro to Philosophy 1010. Our book is The World of Philosophy, an introductory reader by Stephen Kahn. And we're going over Alan Turing, who wrote Computing Machinery and Intelligence. And we're comparing him to John Searle, who wrote Do Computers Think? I guess this was part of his article, Is the Brain's Mind a Computer Program? So John Searle wrote that in 1990, or at least I think his original argument was 1980, but at any rate, that version of it was printed in Scientific American in 1990, and Alan Turing's article came out in 1950. So can computers think? Can you program a computer to become self-aware? So <clears throat> Alan Turing says, well, that might be hard to tell. And I'll get into some of the, I'll read details from his article, but overall, his point was this. If you could arrange an experiment where a questioner asked questions to an unknown person through some type, and it was a typewritten response. If you couldn't tell that the person responding was a computer or not, and if it was a computer, then that computer is intelligent. It has intelligence. You can talk to it, you can change the conversation, and the computer program is programmed to respond in a natural sounding way. If you couldn't tell the difference between a, a human being and a computer, that computer's intelligent. So that was his argument, and he believed um, that that would come to pass. I'll just read on page 125. He says, it will simplify matters for the reader if I explain first my own beliefs in the matter. I believe that in about 50 years time, it will be possible to program computers to make them play the imitation game so well that an average interrogator will not have more than 70% chance of making the right identification after five minutes of questioning. So we get very specific there. So after five minutes of this game with a computer typing back and forth, that he says within 50 years, so that's 20 years ago, since he wrote this in 1950, in 2020 he said that the average interrogator will not have more than a 70% chance of making the right identification after five minutes of questioning. So he's still saying by 2020, um, the average person 70% of the time will be able to tell, oh yeah, after five minutes, oh, this is a computer, these are not responses from a human being. This is some computer searching through a, a, a database. But at any rate, uh, John Searle responded to say that, no, computers can't understand what their programming tells them to do. They just carry through symbolic, um, what's his exact words? Um, symbol manipulating devices is that that's all they are you can manipulate symbols without understanding what the symbols mean and to explain his point he came up with the uh the chinese room argument and his and i'll summarize it he said so i he's saying okay i'm john searle i do not understand chinese so imagine if i'm in a locked up room and someone from outside is slipping me in Chinese symbols, which mean nothing to me. They just look like shapes and squiggles to me. But in the room, I have written in English a book telling me that when I receive certain shaped symbols that I'm supposed to gather together other shaped symbols. So he has a storehouse of Chinese symbols in the room with him and then send them back out in, in little bundles. So he receives Chinese symbols that he doesn't understand. He reads his book. Oh, this Squiggle, squiggle, squoggle, squoggle. That's his example. I then respond with a, some other shape. This series comes in. I put this series out. And he says, after a while, um, you could get good at it. Well, not in our little segment. He doesn't say that. but. And so, and I'll just, I'll just read here. Um, so he says, imagine the people outside the room who, who understand Chinese hand in small bunches of symbols and that in response, I manipulate the symbols according to the rule book. 
and hand back more small bunches of symbols. Now the rule book is the computer program. The people who wrote it are programmers, and I am the computer. The baskets full of symbols are the database. The small bunches that are handed in to me are questions, and the bunches I then hand out our answers. Now suppose that the rule book is written in such a way that my answers to the questions are indistinguishable from those of a native Chinese speaker. For example, the people outside might hand me some symbols that unknown to me mean, what's your favorite color? And I might, after going through the rules, give back symbols that also unknown to me mean my favorite is blue, but I also like green a lot. I satisfy the Turing test for understanding Chinese. All the same, I am totally ignorant of Chinese, and there's no way I could come to understand Chinese in the system as described, since there's no way I can learn the meanings of any of the symbols. Like a computer, I manipulate symbols, but I attach no meaning to the symbols. The point of the thought experiment is this, if I do not understand Chinese solely on the basis of running a computer program for understanding Chinese, then neither does any other digital computer solely on that basis digital computers merely manipulate formal symbols according to the rules in the program what goes for chinese goes for other forms of cognition as well just manipulating the symbol is not by itself enough to guarantee cognition perception understanding thinking and so forth and since computers qua computers are symbol manipulating devices merely running the computer program is not enough to guarantee cognition this simple argument is decisive against the claims of strong AI. So I'll go back and, well, I, since it's such a short article, it's 128 to 130. It's really about a page and a half. Strong AI, strong artificial intelligence theorists, he say, believe that computer programs can recreate a mind. Literally creating minds is a phrase he uses a couple of times. It would, that all a mind is, is a is a program like a computer program it can run on any kind of substrate it could be silicon chips it could be vacuum tubes or some other unknown ingredient but the information the software is the mind and the hardware is the body and he's saying that's strong ai that humans can create or any intelligent beings could create a program that is a thinking mind and he's saying weak Artificial intelligence theorists say that they can't recreate a mind, but they can create a model of the mind to help us understand what a mind is. But they couldn't literally create a mind. And his Chinese symbols experiment was meant to, to show that. Just being able to manipulate symbols doesn't mean you understand what they mean. So, this was the first time I read either one of these articles. I had heard of Alan Turing a lot. I mentioned him previously while teaching this class when I read um, Rene Descartes, and that was one of his tests for being able to tell the difference between a sophisticated robot who looks like a human and an actual human. He said, have a conversation with it. And, um, you know, the computer robot would he use the automaton it wouldn't be able to respond in a natural way it would be pre-programmed with a few responses but it wouldn't take long to figure it out so that is what alan turing is saying about um computer programs uh you know since um this was the first time i read these two articles the one of the things i can do to add to the conversation is just kind of give some context of the historical background for how this came up. So I'm going to read a little bit from uh, Rene Descartes and then also Leibniz because he's got this idea of what what's the difference between a mind and a body. So here's Rene Descartes. This is Discourse on Method, first published in 1649. And he says, on the other hand, if there were machines which bore a resemblance to our body and imitated our actions as far as it was morally possible to do so. I, I don't know what morally possible. Every time I read that, what do you mean morally possible? So we, so should always, uh, we should always have two very certain tests by which to recognize that for all that they were not real men. Two very certain tests. This is the Turing test. The first is that they could never use speech or other signs as we do when placing our thoughts on record for the benefit of others. For we can easily understand a machine's being constituted so that it can utter words and even emit some responses to action on it of a corporeal kind, which brings about a change in its organs. For instance, if it is touched in a particular part, it may ask why we wish to 
what we wish to say to it if another part of it may exclaim that it is being hurt and so on. But it never happens that it arranges its speech in various ways in order to reply appropriately to everything that may be said in its presence, as even the lowest type of man can do. So that was the first test, and that's, that's what Alan Turing said in um, 1950. So 300 years later, um, this was the same test used, but this was the father of artificial intelligence, Alan Turing. He decoded the Nazi Enigma code. They made a movie about him. It was a tragic, a tragic ending of his life. But you see that it's the same exact thing that Descartes said. So Alan Turing said, oh, yes, you can. You can program computers to be able to talk to a human and respond for all contingencies. Or, actually, he didn't go that far. He said, you know, within 50 years, the average person wouldn't be able to tell it's a computer more than 70% of the time after five minutes of conversation. But at any rate, that I'll just go on to the second difference that uh, Descartes talks about, is that although machines can perform certain things as well as, or perhaps better than any of us can do, they infallibly fall short in others, by the which means we may discover that they did not act from knowledge, but only from the dispositions of their organs, for while reason is a universal instrument which can serve for all contingencies, these organs have need of some special adaptation for every particular action. Okay, so that's the first mention of the Turing test I know of from Rene Descartes. So Alan Turing is saying, yeah, well, now we have the ability to program it. And, um, and I think he's got some history has borne him out in some respects because... Uh, here's a book by famous physicist Michio Kaku, The Future of the Mind, and he, he writes about this. That when will computers become intelligent? He believes, like Alan Turing, that they will someday, but he points out a lot of the problems with uh, the, um, the attempts to do so thus far. But he does mention some historical examples of... Um, in, in February 2011, IBM computer called Watson won Jeopardy. Okay, so the show Jeopardy, a trivia game, you know, how, how much knowledge do you have? So the IBM computer won that. Um, and there was another one, something blue. He won a, ch a chess. At, at any rate, at this point in history, computers can beat chess masters. They can beat masters at games like Jeopardy. But could you have a conversation with one and an ongoing conversation, you know, via a chat room or something like that and not be able to tell? I don't think there is a computer that could do that so far. Um, but will that ever come about? I think John Searle's argument was, even if it does come about, that doesn't prove that these machines are intelligent, that they have self-awareness. So these, this whole idea of can you program a computer to think, it raises all sorts of very general questions about the nature of consciousness itself. And this is an introductory class. Uh, I know you, you're not expected to get into all of these kinds of details. Just understand the basic options here. Is consciousness a material byproduct that a certain level of material complexity of the brain produces the epiphenomenon of consciousness or consciousness is just the what we call the process of our nervous system in our brain the electrochemical processes that is what consciousness is it's a category mistake to call it some separate thing like a soul says um i gotta go back and, and read that we went through paul church oh gilbert ryle the ghost in the machine he says, consciousness isn't its separate thing inside a body like a ghost in a machine. Consciousness is just the process of the body, specifically of the brain and nervous system. Is that the case? Or is consciousness an eternal soul pre-programmed with innate forms of knowledge, like Plato said and like Rene Descartes says. Descartes didn't say the soul is eternal, but it's immortal. It's created by God, but it doesn't die. Plato says the soul's eternal, was never created, can never be destroyed. Or, and um, Leibniz agreed 
that the soul can be created or destroyed, but only all at once. So this is, so I'm going to get into some of that just to give you some food for thought and how to answer this, which, so the question for our exam was simply part B, number four, which view on computing in mind makes more sense, Turing's or Searle's? So um, as for all these questions, it doesn't matter for your grade which one you think makes more sense just as long as i can tell you read the article have thought about it and have responded intelligently with some supporting short pertinent quotes so you can you know i believe consciousness is an eternal point very that's very similar to what plato said in descartes and the hindu philosophers who called it atman and i identify that point of eternal consciousness with what physicists call the gravitational singularity. That's what I did my dissertation on, wrote a book about it, or turned the dissertation into a book. So that's my opinion. You don't have to agree with my opinion at all in this class to get a good grade. Just be aware of the basic concepts of each. So is consciousness a material construct? If you have a sophisticated enough machine, will it become self-aware? Or is consciousness a transcendental immaterial point without extension in space. So those are your two basic options. There's plenty of other intermediary options. There might be options completely different from either of those two, but as far as the history of philosophy goes, those are your two basic options. Philo um, you know, Democritus in ancient Greece believes everything comes from little atoms randomly combining in infinite space over an eternal amount of time. That's basically Darwinism. And then Plato said, no, that's not the way it is. We're all these eternal souls and we're imprinted with eternal absolute forms of knowledge, the archetypes of knowledge, the absolute ideas. So, but pertinent to this, um, let me read now from Leibniz. So Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz born in 1646, died in 1716, he independently co-discovered calculus at the same time as Sir Isaac Newton. So he was no slouch. He was a scientist and a mathematician. And his theory of what consciousness is, he called it a monad, which is a single point. And I'm going to read just a little bit here from his his essay, The Monadology, and I'll get to the point where he compares uh, the human brain to a mill. You know, water runs past the, the mill wheel, which turns it and it grinds the grain. So it's just a big machine that you can walk inside of, is his, is his point. So that's where we're heading with this. This is how it's related to the Turing test and John Searle's response. Uh, so from the monadology, he says, The monad of which we shall here speak is nothing but a simple substance which enters into compounds by simple as meant without parts. That means no extension in space. And there must be simple substances since there are compounds, for a compound is nothing but a collection or aggregatum of simple things. Now where there are no parts, there can be neither extension nor form nor divisibility. These monads are the real atoms of nature and, in a word, the elements of things. No dissolution of these elements need be feared, and there is no conceivable way in which a simple substance can be destroyed by natural means. For the same reason, there is no conceivable way in which a simple substance can come into being by natural means, since it cannot be formed by the combination of parts. Thus, it may be said that a monad can only come into being or come to an end all at once. That is to say, it can come into being only by creation and come to an end only by annihilation, while that which is compound comes into being or comes to an end by parts. Well, according to that definition, you could not construct a conscious thinking machine because consciousness is the symptom of a monad, and a monad cannot be created by natural means. So I am identifying the monad with the gravitational singularity. And I think it has a lot of the same qualities as Leibniz's idea of a monad because a gravitational singularity, according to general relativity theory, contains all of space and time and all and every bit of information of everything that ever occurred within all of space and time. So a gravitational singularity, and it, it turns out Singularities are everywhere, just like the monads that Leibniz talks about.
because they're at each point of the underlying quantum vacuum. So these omnipresent gravitational singularity, also it's according to Leibniz's principle of the identity of indiscernibles, if you can't tell the difference between two things, they're identical. You cannot tell a difference between two singularities, at least externally, because they don't have any extension in space and time. They have no structural differences because they have no structure. It's a point. And they're outside of space and time because they contain space, all space and time. It's the source of space time at the Big Bang, the end of space time in every Big Bang, uh, in every black hole. So they're located throughout space time, but they're outside space time, and therefore they're identical to each other, unless you account for their inner qualities, which Leibniz does. And that's how you can differentiate one monad from another, from its perceptions. But perceptions cannot come from a machine, he'll go on to say. So I'm, I'm going to read two more paragraphs, and um, this will just help provide a context for understanding this debate between the strong artificial intelligence theory and people like John Searle, who says you'll never be able to program consciousness. So continuing with Leibniz, further, there is no way of explaining how a monad can be altered in quality or internally changed by any other created thing, since it is impossible to change the place of anything in it or to conceive in it any internal motion which could be produced, directed, increased, or diminished therein. Although all this is possible in the case of compounds in which there are changes among the parts, the monads have no windows through which anything could come in or go out. Accidents cannot separate themselves from... All right, they have no windows through which anything... So how do monads communicate? The Leibniz comes up with the idea of the pre-established harmony. God, the supreme monad, knows what you're going to do and he knows what the other monad is going to do. And he orchestrates, he synchronizes your responses with each other. So though you're not actually having contact with each other, each of you is living in a separate illusion preordained by God to interact with each other as if you were having contact. So that's a very strange logical implication of Leibniz's philosophy. But for the purpose of the question of can you program a machine to think, I'm going now to the last little paragraph from the monadology. This is the idea of the mill. So a mill is just a big house with wheels and cranks and gears that are moving, pushed by a, a stream that pushes the 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 wheel, you know. So at any rate, a, a mill, if you look it up, you'll see what a mill is. So moreover, it must be confessed that perception and that which depends upon it are inexplicable on mechanical grounds, that is to say, by means of figures and motions. And supposing there were a machine so constructed as to think, feel, and have perception, it might be conceived as increased in size while keeping the same proportions so that one might go into it as into a mill. That being so, we should on examining its interior find only parts which work one upon another and never anything by which to explain a perception. Thus it is in a simple substance and not in a compound or in a machine that perception must be sought for Further, nothing but this, namely perceptions and their changes, can be found in a simple substance. It is also in this alone that all the internal activities of simple substances can consist in perception. So simple substances, monads, do have change. They experience change, but it's all internal among perceptions, which can't be seen. You can't look into a monad. It has no window. And a monad can't look out at the world around it. But for the purpose of our discussion of can you program a machine to think, Leibniz would say no. Just imagine the computer program if you expanded it. Now, as I was reading it, I was like, well, a computer program has to do with you know, electronic signals down at the quantum level, and the laws of physics are different at the quantum level and the macroscopic level that Isaac Newton's physics described. So that analogy has a lot of problems, but still, I think the issue is this. What physical process could you point to if everything in the process is made of, you know, as a tangible thing extended in space? How could that ever account for something so seemingly categorically different as a perception, as awareness? Now we saw um, 
Gilbert Ryle, the ghost in the machine, I'll remember his name eventually after teaching this book a few times, that he says that is exactly what is happening, a category mistake, that's all consciousness is, is a process, a physical process of the brain. But Mill says, okay, how could you add up all these physical things and you have a process whereby they're operating together still? How, how would you ever come up with consciousness? So his point was consciousness doesn't have extension in space. Plato said the same thing, for example, in the dialogue, the Phaedo. And he also talked about the absolute ideas of knowledge imprinted on each soul. So each soul, and unlike Descartes, Plato, or he had Socrates, his mentor, he wrote dialogues featuring Socrates most of the time, not always. But so Plato, through Socrates, believed that every living thing has an eternal soul, which is imprinted with all of the absolute forms of universal knowledge, but that only humans have reason, which enables us to become aware of these absolute forms, but even um, plants and insects and, and birds and fish and animals, they are, each of them is an eternal soul pre-programmed eternally with all of the knowledge of the universe. So that's... Um, that is, that's why I, I, I cite that as evidence for the theory that psyche equals singularity, which is what my dissertation was entitled. Um, so if, if that's the case, if as Plato and Leibniz say, that consciousness is a monad, a point of infinite knowledge that is not extended in space, then you cannot create a machine to become conscious unless you could somehow harness a, a gravitational singularity, in which case you weren't creating consciousness, but you might be able to create a machine that could then allow that particle of consciousness to communicate with others through that machine. I, I had a conversation with a, a friend of mine a long time ago about this. Well, if this if consciousness is this little eternal point, a gravitational singularity, what does that say about artificial intelligence? And that's what I, that's our conclusion was, well, you can't create intelligence. You might be able to create a machine that could embody that soul. And then you could talk to that machine and you'd be like, wow, this, so, this machine is emotionally aware. It's aware of itself in every which way that I could tell. Um, but that wouldn't be having created a thinking computer, it would have been creating a body for an eternal soul, which is a different philosophical question. Um, as I'm saying that, I'm like, man, you could write a pretty cool movie about that, a fictional story. You, someone created, finally, we have a self-aware machine, but what was it? You just captured some reincarnating soul that got sucked into your machine and it's having flashbacks to previous lives. <laughs> anyway, um, so that's uh, that, I think think will be, you know, I want to say one more thing. So Michio Kaku, he has a definition for uh, self-awareness. And then after that, I am going to go back and just read a little more of the details of each of these essays that we went through. But for Michio Kaku, here's his definition of self-awareness. Self-awareness is creating a model of the world and simulating the future in which you appear. I know Richard Dawkins, the famous advocate of Darwinism, an enemy of ideas of God and the soul and any other non-physical belief system. He said the same thing. It's self-awareness is seeing yourself, simulating yourself in the future. It has survival value. You, you have to think of different scenarios and then the ultimate scenario would include you in it. And now you have, oh, there I am. You are observing yourself, self-awareness, aware of yourself in the future. So then the question would be, can you make computers that are aware of themselves in the future that can simulate the future, including themselves in it? And um, I just thought that was another interesting way to phrase the question. Could you design a computer to do that? So all these questions about whether or not you could create a thinking machine, whether or not you'll ever be able, anyone will ever be able to do that, it's a good question for bringing up very general and fundamental questions about the nature of consciousness itself. Okay, so with the overview in place, now let me go back um, to the video here. Sometimes I
click it off and that's no fun. So Alan Turing. Um, so I, I read some of his, his idea of this game. At first it was a more elaborate game where you had a man and a woman and somebody and a third person asking each and the man was supposed to lie and trick the questioner into thinking he was a woman and the woman, her job was to co convince the questioner of the truth. So then he said, okay, there's a game. Now replace the man, the liar, with a computer. Would the questioner be able to tell? So that just makes it more complicated. And then he said that I'll make a prediction, he says, in 50 years' time, um, that if someone playing the average interrogator will not have more than 70% chance of making the right identification after five minutes of questioning. All right. So then... Just to give to fill in some some detail from these articles, the argument from consciousness. So there's some of the rebuttals that Alan Turing was responding to. So this argument is very well expressed in Professor Jefferson's Lister Oration for 1949, from which I quote: "Not until a machine can write a sonnet or compose a concerto because of thoughts and emotions felt, and not by the chance fall of symbols." Could we agree that machine equals brain? That is, not only write it, but know that it had written it. No mechanism could feel, and not merely artificially signal, an easy contrivance. Pleasure at its successes, grief when it, its valves fuse, you know, being charmed by sex and all these other things. So, Alan Turing responds to that, that this is the solipsist point of view, because, okay, by that, same reasoning, nobody can be sure that anybody else has any thoughts unless you become that person and experience their experience. Um, so then he said, if you want to avoid that solipsist point of view, then he says, in short then, I think that most of those who support the argument from consciousness could be persuaded to abandon it rather than be forced into the solipsist position. They will then probably be willing to accept our test. So he's saying, how could you ever prove that anybody else has consciousness but yourself? If you're saying that, that you have to know that the machine feels pleasure, well, how would you know that it feels pleasure? How could you know that anybody else feels pleasure? You could build a sophisticated machine that could imitate pleasure very well, you know, that could imitate the experience of pleasure, but you wouldn't be able to prove that unless you became the machine. So he's saying, assuming we can't become a machine and be aware of what it is experiencing, if anything at all, then we have to have some other kind of a test. And he's saying, my test of this conversation between you and a machine through some typewritten medium so that you couldn't distinguish it's, whether it's a human or not by listening to the voice or seeing even the difference between an average man and an average woman's type of handwriting. He says, so that's a much more... Um, reasonable test of artificial intelligence and then he says the reason most people i think don't believe that it'll ever be possible to program a computer to think is scientific induction which is we went over deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning inductive reasoning can only ever give you at best probable knowledge it's based on things you've experienced in the past i've seen every time anyone's ever put their finger in a fire it hurts them. They feel pain. So therefore, putting your finger in fire in fire will cause your finger to burn. That's scientific induction. There's probably never, well, there are cases, um, you know, how quickly you can put it through. But holding your finger in a fire, not burning, unless you're some kind of a yogi or a saint with some mystical power that will burn you. But you can never be absolutely certain that that must always be the case everywhere in the universe, always in the past and in the future, because all you're doing is saying, well, I've seen it happen many times, so it, I assume it will probably happen in the future. Deductive reasoning will give you definite knowledge. If the premises are true, then the conclusion of the argument must necessarily be true. If the conclusion could be false, then the premise is, then it's not deductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning gives you certain universal absolute knowledge. We went over this with Kant. And um, is it possible to have certain absolute deductive knowledge? But f getting back to this, so scientific induction, you've never seen a computer think before, so that's what makes you think you'll never see one. They're too big and clumsy. Of course, the revolution in minimizing the size of the computer chips has, you know, made the 
the average cell phone. You know, the smartphone, here's one I, ha I had to buy because my other one went down the sewer one day in a freak accident of a thunderstorm. But at any rate, no matter how sophisticated these computers get, will they ever become self-aware? That's the question. And Turing is saying, well, at least I'll tell you this much. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a conversation with one and, an, and a human being, you know, if it was through some typewritten medium. And then John Searle, he said um, that that's fine. You might be able to trick somebody into thinking that's a human you're talking to, but just manipulating symbols doesn't guarantee cognition that you understand what is being said. And then as I was writing that, I was thinking of Henri Bergson, the 20th century philosopher who wrote about metaphysics, and he differentiated between two types of knowledge, analytical knowledge and intuition. And you can only know yourself, the act of being aware through intuition. Analytical knowledge is, is observing things outside of your own feeling of, of awareness and for that, you use symbolic language to describe things. So here's a book. It's Michio Kaku's book. So it's a book. There's a word. That's a symbol. Okay, this is a book, but so is, you know, our textbook. Here's the original textbook that I was teaching when I first started here. There's a lot of books. So book, yes, this is a book, but there's an infinite number of books probably in all the universes of the megaverse. So that symbol gives you an idea of what it is, but it doesn't tell you exactly what it is. So, okay, it's a it's a book with a bluish color. Blue applies to a trillions and trillions of things. So symbols tell you what a thing is similar to, but it doesn't tell you what it is. It compares one thing to a bunch of things that it isn't. It's similar to them, but it isn't. So it can never give you absolute knowledge. It can only give you relative knowledge. I can relate this to other things that are book-like. I can relate this to other things that are bluish. But it'll never tell me exactly what this thing is in itself. Symbolic language could never do that. Neither numbers nor words. So then how could I ever have knowledge of what I am uniquely as me? And he says that would be through an act of intuition. And to have that, it would all be all at once, just like Leibniz said. All, it would occur all at once. You can't... There's no natural means by which you could create cognition... It just is there all at once. You, there's no assembly time required. So this is, um, and, and you wouldn't be able to express that experience with, sim, with symbols because symbols ex compare one thing to things that it's similar to but isn't, that it's similar to but different than. So regarding the idea of whether or not you could program a computer to think, and now that I'm saying program, I'm going to read a little bit from John Searle. Um, <clears throat> you could program it, a computer to respond to certain stimuli, including words and facial expressions of other people. But John Searle says, even if you programmed it perfectly so that it responds in a, in a way that perfectly mimics a human being, that doesn't mean that it understands anything of what it's experiencing. Um, but this idea of programming, on page 129, so John Searle, he begins by saying, maybe it'll be possible to create thinking machines. After all, the human being is a machine, a biological machine, and we think. So it implies to me he thinks consciousness is a byproduct of Darwinian evolution, not an eternal soul. But his point was, I don't know if you believe that or not, but he's saying it might be possible to create a machine that thinks. Plato and Leibniz would never agree to that because they say you can construct an indivisible point of of infinite knowledge. And even though they both said that, we forget the knowledge and you have to learn it. It's not that it's always manifest to you. Um, all right, but continuing with John Searle, in recent decades, however, the question of whether a machine could think has been given a different interpretation entirely. The question that has been posed in its place is, could a machine think just by virtue of implementing a computer program? Is the program by itself constitutive of thinking? This is a completely different question because it is not about the physical causal properties of actual or possible physical systems, but rather about the abstract computational properties of formal computer programs that can be implemented in any sort of substance at all, provided only that the substance is able to carry the program. 
So can you program a mind? Um, and he's saying no. You couldn't write code that would be considered self-aware. And um, I've got a lot of other thoughts on this topic. I was just thinking back to Michio Kaku's book, but I'm going to leave it there for now. And in our next video, I'll be going over uh, Barbara Montero's criticisms of physicalism.